now. 0345 6060 973. This is LBC. Could there be a more appropriate time than to welcome the Conservative MP and Chairman of the European Research Group, Jacob Rees-Mogg, here to take your calls on Ring Rees-Mogg. And before we come to the first caller, just a couple of questions from me. Mr Rees-Mogg, welcome to the studio. Thanks Mr Ferrari, good morning. Thank you. Would Theresa May survive a no-confidence vote? I don't think a no-confidence vote is immediately in the offing. Uh, I think what the Prime Minister needs to do is to give up on the Trekkers' proposals, which David Davis, in his resignation letter, has pointed out don't actually deliver Brexit. What is so? If I read you some of the, this is the Prime Minister's response. This is what we take from Chequers, Mr. Rees-Mogg. A new business-friendly customs model with freedom to strike new trade deals around the world. A UK-EU free trade area with a common rule block, a rule book for industrial goods and agricultural products, which will be good for jobs. What's not to like about the Chequers Accord? Well, the European Union is not good for jobs. To suggest it is is simply untrue. That if you look at unemployment rates across the European Union and youth unemployment rates, you see how high they are. And what we're signing up to, this common rule book, is known as the Acqui Communitaire. It's not some new common rule book. It's the EU's rules which we will be accepting and new rules which we will be accepting. Um, and these have been job-destroying and have made economies less efficient. So signing up to that is A, not Brexit, and B, not economically wise. How damaged is she by Mr Davis's resignation? Well, I don't think it's as much by that as by Chequers, because the problem with Chequers is that the Prime Minister was very clear that Brexit would mean Brexit. She made any number of statements indicating that she was going to do it properly, and then she has decided to have a basically Remain approach to the negotiations. And that is what has done her damage. So can a Remain a MP, a PM stay in position? Well, she is in position, and the Conservative Party doesn't have a great history of changing its leader. I think it's the policy that matters rather more than the leader, and the policy decided at Chequers was decided by a majority of people who backed Remain in the referendum against the 17.4 million people who backed Leave. Uh, and this is really telling, that if you look at the Cabinet, they all voted, well, not a formal vote, they all gave their view in accordance with the view they'd taken two years ago in the referendum, and the Remainers sought to stymie Brexit. And I think that is deeply unsatisfactory. Let's get to some calls. I'm sure I'll have hopefully <coughs> some time with you in a moment. Phil in Leatherhead, you're through to Jacob rees -Mogg. Go ahead, Phil. Good morning, Jacob. How are you? Good morning, Phil. Well, thank you. And you? Fine, thank you. My question is, do you think that Theresa May has put her party before the Brexit? Um... No, I don't think she's put her party before Brexit. Uh, I, I think the difficulty is that she doesn't really believe in leaving the European Union, and she backed Remain in the first place and appointed cabinet ministers who backed Remain. Uh, and I think she doesn't see the great advantages, the opportunities of leaving this failing organisation, which um, has so many problems. So I don't think it's a party country. Uh, I think it's just Theresa May being Theresa May. Phil? I think you're absolutely right on that score but I think from the outset she has been a Remainer and has left it so late I mean we have got very little time to get a deal together um, my personal view is I think uh, all along no deal is better than a bad deal and I think this deal at Chequers is a bad deal for us it is not what we voted for Phil I agree with your analysis uh, and I think this is very similar to the way, as Home Secretary, the Prime Minister approached the opt-in and opt-outs to the justice and home affairs issues. Um, she made a great noise about having opted out of a very large number of things and then opted back into all the important ones that made a difference and had legal consequences. And I think that's basically what she's doing now. There's a lot of frippery around the Chequers statement, but the core is that we're basically in the Acqui Communitaire. Phil, thank you. Paddy in Doncaster. Paddy, you're on the radio. Good morning. Morning, Jacob. Good morning, Paddy. Thank you for calling. How would you rate May's current Brexit out of ten? And as you vote for hard Brexit, why is it such a likely? How would you rate it out of ten? And how is a, a, a hard Brexit likely? How likely is a hard Brexit now, Jacob rees -Mogg. Well, I give the proposals from Chequers four out of ten. There are some elements which are genuine Brexit, but not enough. Uh, what is the chance of a hard Brexit? I think the chance of a no deal coming about because uh, not a, no proper offer is made, because time has been allowed to go by, 
uh, looks likely by accident rather than design. What we should be doing is taking up Donald Tusk of his, on his offer for a Canada-style free trade agreement, which gives us most of what we want, uh, gives us access to their markets. He said without tariffs and without quotas, we could do the same for them, and we could do it quite quickly. But that's the base offer that we should go for and would be better than no deal. OK, so you give it four out of ten as is the rating. Paddy, how many do you give it? Paddy, what do you give it out of ten, my friend? I think we're tra- tra- uh, struggling with the connection with Paddy. Thank you. We move on. Now, earlier in the show, Alistair Campbell was uh, speaking with me, and he was very excited by the fact that you were coming on the show later. So he gave me this question for you. Given that he and his have failed utterly to signal to the country what the plan post-referendum is going to be, given that his hard Brexit would do fundamental last damage to the economy, and if he's so confident in his case, why is he so scared of it going back to the people? So that is, if you're so confident of, of the plan, why don't you let it go back to the people? I know we had a, cl- a break on that line, unfortunately, as well. Mr rees Well, there, there were three questions in that. First of all, the question of a plan. There is a plan, is to have a Canada-style free trade agreement which gets us the benefits of free trade, which is what people always wanted uh, with Europe. The second is the hysterical view of the Remainers on the economic consequences. They've been so consistently wrong on Project Fear. Think of the Treasury saying we'd have to have a punishment budget just for voting to leave, unemployment rise by up to 800,000. Um, Mr Campbell is once again pursuing Project Fear, and actually the economic opportunities where 90% of global growth is going to come from are from outside the European Union. Uh, and why not a second vote? We've had a vote. Does he believe in a democracy where you carry on voting until you get the result Mr Campbell wants? I don't think that's particularly democratic. And your views aren't coloured in any way, shape or form by what we heard from Jaguar Land Rover last week, in which they, they talked of tens of thousands of jobs if there was a bad Brexit deal. Um, I thought it was a very odd statement for Jaguar Land Rover to make, because uh, 78% of their sales come from either the UK or outside the European Union. Their European market has been stagnant, whereas their Chinese market has been growing very rapidly. And it seemed to me that it was strange for Jaguar Land Rover to focus on their declining market rather than on their growing markets, which have nothing to do with the European Union. Tom's in Liverpool. You're through to Jacob rees Tom, go ahead. Yeah, morning, Nick. Yes. Morning, sir. My question, yes, good morning. My question for Mr rees is this. that It's been no secret for years that the Tory party is split from top to bottom over Europe. Is it now just not inevitable that the only way they... Well, the only solution for the party is to divide into two, probably a pro-Brexit party and a pro-Europe party. The the animosities are just so visceral between the two camps. It seems to me, as an outsider, almost impossible for them to survive together. Um, Tom, that's a very interesting question on how deep the divisions are. And I think you're right to say top to bottom, or perhaps top from bottom. Because if you talk to the grassroots of the Conservative Party and indeed Conservative voters, polling shows that 70% of Conservative voters are in favour of a proper departure from the European Union. And in Conservative associations, I would expect that that would be even higher. So the Conservative Party is very strongly in favour of Brexit. Uh, The leaders, I'm afraid, have been um, bitten by the establishment bug and are nervous of leaving. And that's a, a, a... problem for the party and it leads well, to this division. What's the antidote then, if they've been bitten by the, the bug? The antidote is that the leadership should carry out the result of the referendum and that would keep the party, no it, the party there, together. If anything, they're going backwards with Friday, Friday's events at Chequers. Oh, Friday's events was um, turning red lines into a white flag. Yes, it's um, not an impressive outcome at all. And David Davis has made that so clear in his resignation uh, letter. Was that um, principled, what Mr Davis did? It was extremely principled, uh, from a position where he was meant to be implementing the policy. Did you know he was going to do this? I didn't know he was going to, but I knew it was possible. R- how did you know that it was possible? I knew it was possible because I heard gossip that it was possible. Right, OK. Have you spoken with him? Not since he resigned. No. What no. would you say to him? When, what will you say to him when you next speak with him? Oh, congratulate him. I think that he has done a great service to his country, and this is a real prospect for rescuing Brexit and pulling it away from the failure of Chequers. Does he need to make some form of a speech in the, ca- in the House today? Jeffrey um, Howe style? Uh, 
The, the, the personal statement that is allowable by any member of parliament, uh, no more than three minutes and the text shown to the speaker in advance, can be a very dramatic parliamentary moment, but just because Geoffrey House was doesn't mean that all in future will be. And David Davis has great personal loyalty to uh, the Prime Minister, uh, and so that I wouldn't... actually comes across in his letter to a it, sense. It, 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 he's worked with Mrs May for a long time, he's loyal to her, he likes her, as he was saying on, on the radio earlier this morning, uh, and so I wouldn't expect a Geoffrey Howe-style uh, speech. OK. Um, is 48 is the magical number by which Graham Brady, your effective shop steward, has to trigger some form of challenge. How many of those 48 are present at this time, do you imagine? I have, no, I have no idea. Have you filed a letter? No. You've ha you're not seeking the leadership of the party? No, no, of course I'm not. I'm seeking Brexit. I, 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 many times I'm asked this question. The key for the country it wouldn't be is that we get... <laughs> If I didn't talk to you about the cricket and ask you if you want to be Prime Minister, it wouldn't be a meeting between the We've two of us. We've got to do it every fortnight. But <laughs> the, the, the key is Brexit is delivered properly. That is what I'm ambitious for and what members of the ERG are ambitious for. And personal ambition is, I think, so trivial group. compared to the interests of the nation. Yeah, but we've not got closer to it, have we, as a result of Friday, Mr Rees-Mogg? No, Friday's taken us away from it. And it's very important that David Davis resigned because... At the point at which all the senior Eurosceptics in the Cabinet were backing it, then one had to assume that there must be something in the detail that magically showed that it was a good idea. David Davis's resignation has shown that the three pages that we've seen are um, a sample of the lot and that it isn't really Brexit. You're absolutely right to point out, I do ask you on a monotonous basis how many times whether you want to be leader or Prime Minister. How about this one? about being Brexit Secretary, Mr Meesmog? Um, I would not accept the job under the terms in which David Davis has had to do it. So, if you could recraft, if we no, could have Chequers 2 or whatever it might be? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't think um, it is a job that can be done under the current setup. The Prime Minister constantly overrules the Brexit Secretary, doesn't seem even to have kept him in the loop on occasions, tried to bounce him uh, with other ministers. This is not the way our system of government is meant to run. Who do you think would be good in that post? Well, one hardly sees there's any point in it. If it's all done by Downing Street, uh, you would begin to think that the department is there going through the motions. So the suggestion of Michael Gove has no merit? Um, why would Michael Gove want to do a job where he will be constantly overruled by the Prime Minister? To the calls, Jason in Southend. Jason, you're on the radio. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Jason. Hi, good morning. Um, my question would be, why is the UK government so scared to negotiate with the European Union. It seems like they keep being the ones that, to make the concessions and they seem to have been on the back foot from the start. Now, as far as I'm aware, David Davis himself was a Remainer who has now quit because it seems he can't negotiate with the European Union. Why is the government so obsessed with trying to get a deal with them now rather than playing a bit more hardball? Mr. Well, Jason, I agree with you. And uh, David Davis was a Leaver. He campaigned yes, so strongly for Leave. Yeah. Um, but he said in his letter, uh, the general direction of policy will leave us in at best a weak negotiating position and possibly an inescapable one. So David Davis has basically resigned for your reasons that he thinks the negotiating position is too weak. And I'm afraid I think the reason for the weakness is not that members of the Cabinet lack backbone but they don't actually believe in Brexit. That's the underlying problem, and you see this so clearly in the votes in the Cabinet, that the Remainers voted not really for Brexit, and the Leavers believe in it. And I heard a statement from a government source uh, who said the government faced two problems. One was how to deliver the Leave vote, and the second was how to make it a success. Now, that very comment implies that the government doesn't really believe in Brexit, because people like me think leaving is a phenomenal success in itself and gives us all these opportunities to manage the economy uh, the way we want, to set our rules, to set our domestic policy agenda without Brussels interference. And the thought that there is a balance between leaving and a success seems to me an indication that the government simply doesn't believe in the policy that it has promised the people. And governments must stick to their promises. Quick response from you, Jason. See, uh, no, I, I completely you agree. agree. You completely agree, all right. Thank Isn't you, Jason. It, and you, it's interesting you would mention, thanks, Jason, you, you speak from the sort of, from the bottom of the party to the top and the sense that the Prime Minister and others might be slightly 
tone deaf, is it not a reality that the last Conservative manifesto spelt out that there must be a Brexit? So if there's any doubt, the government's only serving as a result of that promise. I agree with that, that, um, that the Prime Minister's statements up until Chequers were completely clear that we would have a proper Brexit. And Chequers is not just a U-turn, it's a handbrake turn. Was Chequers ever necessary? Did they all need to go there last Friday? Oh, it was an attempt to bounce people into a policy that they weren't going to like. They were only given the documents at short notice. Uh, I don't think it was a proper way of conducting cabinet government. She doesn't make great decisions, does she, the Prime Minister? Well, this, one, this one isn't a great decision. General election, checkers meetings, others, not good calls. Well, even Homer nods. <clears throat> Even Homer nods. Even Homer nods. <laughs> even, even the greatest people make the occasional mistake. Yes. Was Ferrari, I expect even... No, no, sorry, that can't be right. <laughs> well, she's no Gareth Southgate, that's for sure, is she? Um, let's go to another call. Harry in Dover. Harry, you're on the radio. Good morning. Yes, it's a message. Um, a question for uh, Jacob rees Smog. If trade is so important for us to leave the common market, why is it that Germany does four times more exports than we do? And they are in the EU and do not seem to be limited by what the EU states. Well, the issue with trade for us is as much goods coming in as going out, uh, and that the EU forces us to have higher costs of food, clothing and footwear, which, um, as I've said on this programme before, uh, hit the um, incomes of the least well-off in society the hardest, uh, and makes our economy less competitive because we're buying higher-priced goods. So... Um, the issue with trade is both ways. It's not just one way. Uh, and we need to be freer to do trade deals because what we're trying to sell is basically services. And most trade deals done by the European Union have concentrated on goods, so haven't been particularly to our advantage. <coughs> Harry? Yes? Your uh, response? I can't agree with that. I mean, we buy in what we want. And we buy in as much as we do because we're voracious... Um, spenders we want to have things that is why we buy a lot i can't go along with the fact that um it's because of the nature of the goods that we export we are very heavy into electronics to aviation these are big things that germany is very good at manufacturing and producing why is it that leaving the common market would put us in a better position that is what i cannot understand i'm a lever I voted leave, but everything that is I'm hearing is telling me, hang on a second, I haven't seen a real argument to support my belief that we should leave. And, and Jacob Rees-Mogg is sidestepping the issue right now, I think. Tell me why Germany exports four times more stuff than we do. The, the, the issue I was focusing on and the point I'm trying to make is the common market puts up the price of goods in the United Kingdom. So tariffs on food average 23%, and non-tariff barriers are higher. And that means that every week, British consumers pay more money to subsidise inefficient European businesses. That is not economically successful. And we have a huge trade deficit with the European Union, and not because they're the most efficient producers as goods, and I accept your point that we are voracious consumers, but we could get that voracious consumption from other countries more cheaply to the benefit both of individuals and to the total economy. The, the common market is fortress Europe. It is not an efficient trading system. Uh, as for um, Germany's trade, absolutely, they are very efficient at selling their products around the world. Um, but their um, manufacturing skill is not where we have the biggest part of our economy. Our economy is based on services. And services are subject to other constraints that have not been removed in trade deals that the EU has made. Harry, thank you for that. Um, as and when the Chequers proposals, the Chequers Accord, comes to the House of Commons, do you think it will su get support from Conservative MPs? Uh, no, I think if the government wants to get Chequers through, it will do so on the back of Labour votes, which would be a great mistake. So she would get it through, but using Labour votes? She may get it through using Labour votes. I can't be sure of that. No. Uh, but I think there's a large number of Conservative MPs who will not vote for Chequers because uh, they committed to their constituents uh, to vote for Brexit. Would that number of MPs in number 48? Uh, I, that I don't know. I think this obsession with um, the number 48 I I is a sort of like um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, trying to work out symbolism from random right. things. The, so there's, you, you, don't, you don't see a confidence vote in the offing? But frankly, I think people are much more concerned about the policy than the individual. And there is 
a large number of people, I don't know how many, who will be willing to vote down uh, bad legislation. Um, but I think focusing on that and focusing on what comes before Parliament is where people's attention will be. So Mrs May is Prime Minister in March next year. Um, uh, who knows when she will decide that she's had enough of this. Well, but, the decision might be made for her, of course. I think, the, I think the odds are that, yes, she will be Prime Minister in March of next year. All right, let's come to some more calls. Uh, Brandon in Romford. Brandon, you're through to Jacob rees -Mogg. Go ahead. It's not the chairman of the Conservative Party, it's I assume. Brandon. I've had him already. No, he's had his turn. <laughs> Brandon Lewis has had his turn. Brandon of Romford, go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, morning Brandon. Sir. Pleasure. Uh, Mr. rees -Mogg. Uh, President Trump arrives in the UK on Friday, and London protesters will be flying a blimp depicting him as an orange-coloured baby. What are your thoughts on this, and uh, what does it say about the special relationship? This is the giant, angry orange baby. Well, I think it's a completely childish stunt. Um, the United States is our most important ally. Regardless of what you think about the special relationship, uh, the US has been instrumental to our security from the middle of the Second World War onwards. And to insult the leader of a foreign nation in that way um, is very bad, cheap politics. And the people behind that stunt uh, should be ashamed of themselves. They're, they're just showing themselves to be uh, um, juvenile and delinquent. Mayor Sadiq Khan thinks differently, Mr rees -Mogg. He's permitted it. He demeans his office. Quick response from you, Brandon. Um, well, I, I would put another question to you, Mr. Rees-Mogg, which is that if that is a childish stunt and it's cheap politics, then what would you call President Trump's daily tweeting in which he uh, blasts both domestic leaders and foreign leaders, whether it be Justin Trudeau and Angela Merkel or um, Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi in his own, in his own country? Um, Mr. Trump was democratically elected by the people of the United States in a free and fair election. They have decided to have him as their president. As president of the United States, I respect him. Uh, I think we would be uh, irritated as a country uh, if Her Majesty went to Washington and people decided to put up a rude balloon about her. I think we have a duty to be polite to the leaders of our close allies. And there's no benefit in us getting involved in the minutiae of US politics and Donald Trump's tweets. We're not his voters, and we should respect the vote of the United States. It's not so much about Mr. Trump as an individual. It's about do we respect the voters in the United States? Brandon, thank you for that. Um, you are known to have a tremendous command of the English language, as is one of your Conservative colleagues, Boris Johnson, with all due apologies. When he described the, the uh, uh, Chequers Accord as attempting to polish a turd, how disappointed were you in that choice of language? Well, it's not the terminology that I would employ personally. How would you describe it? How would I describe the Chequers yes. statement? Not Brexit. Simple as that. No. All right. Uh, ah, Neil in North Wales, but not any Neil. Neil, in introduce yourself. Good morning. Morning, Nick. It's Neil Hamilton here. Oh, Nick. hello, Neil. How are you? Good morning, Jacob. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask you whether you think one of the reasons why the government has made such a horlicks of the Brexit negotiations is that uh, the Tory party has rather lost its fear of UKIP. And uh, we got the referendum in the first place because of the rise of UKIP, a lot of people, after the referendum, thought UKIP's job was done. It's now clear that it isn't done, and we're far from completing the project of leaving the EU. So the best way to impose some kind of common sense on people like Theresa May is for UKIP to rise again. The, the, the problem is, Neil, it's gone from UKIP to WHOKIP, and that UKIP's disappeared from the scene. It certainly hasn't disappeared from the scene, because I'm still there. Well, yes, but all by yourself in the moonlight. I mean, it, it's... I, I, you, we agree on leaving the European Union, but UKIP has lost its force, and its force really was Nigel Farage, uh, and without him at the helm, uh, UKIP has had endless trouble, um, and I think N Nigel remains a very powerful advocate for leaving the European Union properly, and does so um, eloquently on LBC. Quick response from you, Neil. He, he, he needs to do things outside of the studios of LBC, in my opinion. We, we definitely need to get the People's Army on the move again. Gerard Batten is making a good fist of uh, stabilising the ship after a period of extreme turbulence. Well, let's see if uh, Jacob, do you think uh, he refers to the new UKIP leader? Is he doing a good job? Well, thank you for saying who he was, because I was momentarily lost who Mr. I was Batten... I the listener, Mr. Rees oh, well, you were helping me as well. <laughs> um, uh, UKIP played a very important role, 
There's no denying that, put great pressure on David Cameron, on the Conservative Party to promise the referendum. UKIP's uh, role in getting us to the vote to leave the European Union is of historic proportions, but it's disappeared, uh, and that's it. OK, but we've got time for it. Thank you, Neil. Good hearing from you. Probably the final question. Yes, it will be. Annette in Chippingham. Go ahead, Annette. You're through to Jacob rees Hello, Nick. Hello, Jacob. Hello. Annette, good morning. Hello there. Um, I'm wondering how likely you believe it to be if for a Labour government to get in, should we not execute the outcome of the vote two years ago? Because I say this as a Conservative voter my whole life. As long as Theresa May is at the helm, I will no longer vote Conservative because I feel that integrity has been compromised here. Well, uh, Annette, I think you put your finger on the issue that the polling indicates that 70% of Conservative voters back leave and that they are disappointed with checkers, and I think Conservative voters, Leave voters, will be unwilling to vote for a party that has failed them. There's no political margin in the Conservatives not delivering Brexit, perhaps most of all because we promised we would. And I now bang you on can't about this. continue with her at the top, but then. But po politicians have to deliver on their promises. Which she's failed to do, Mr rees -Mogg. Checkers does not deliver on her promises. If so you go how through, can you continue to support well, her? She is the Prime Minister, and I want the policy to change. But what likelihood is there of policy change? Well, You've just spelled out 70%, and I, I take that figure, someone like Annette, who's clearly a party yeah. supporter, can no longer put a tick in the box all the time Mrs May heads the party. Well, I, I, I think we need the policy to be changed, and I hope that people like Annette will tell their Conservative members of Parliament how strongly they feel. I think this is really important, because... I think that uh, voters want Brexit done and done properly, and particularly Conservative voters, and that the leadership of the Conservative Party needs to understand this uh, and get back to where it was before checkers. Quick response, Annette, before I let Mr Ross Rees mogg go. Uh, my hand would still waver putting a tick in the box for Theresa May while she's at the helm, although obviously my heart is with Conservatism. I hope that something... I hope that she goes the bottom line. If she doesn't, I feel... I fear for the party... And I fear that Corbyn will be in at number 10. Isn't that a real danger? Thank you so much, Annette. Isn't that a real danger that you and your colleagues the Conservative Party allow Je uh, Jeremy Corbyn into number 10? I think Annette is right. If we don't do Brexit properly, that is the best chance for Jeremy Corbyn because people will feel so badly let down. Uh, and How would the country view the Conservatives subsequently? Well, it would be very bad for us. And this goes to my point that if the government tries to get a weak Brexit, a non-Brexit through on Labour votes the Conservative Party will be in serious trouble. As we've been speaking, it's funny, you were talking, I, I talked to you about how likely it is they might be able to get the Chequers deal through the House. You said they'd need Labour votes. It's just been announced that Labour MPs have been invited to a briefing on the Chequers deal by the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff later today. So that's the Labour team. You smile wryly for my radio listeners. Your reaction, Mr Rees-Mogg? My reaction is that the government realises that it hasn't got Conservative votes for this non-Brexit uh, and will therefore try to rely on the opposition. Um, Can I, you govern like this, Mr rees uh, It would be a very bad way to try to govern, to alienate a very large section of your party and a majority of the members and rely on socialists to get your policy through. I, I, if the government is planning to do this, um, the government will run out of steam. It won't be able to do anything beyond sitting there waiting for the clock to tick down on the Fixed Term Parliament Act. And you'd continue, you and your colleagues would allow that to happen. You still see her as Prime Minister this time next Look, year. I've said very clearly that under the Fixed Term Parliament Act, I will not vote against the government uh, on a vote of confidence. I've said that dozens of times. Um, Mrs May's position is secondary to the policy. All right. Should we lift the mood lastly? I, don't, I know you're hugely supportive of cricket. I don't know whether you're, any of your children into football in any way. Well, they, they've started getting the football cards and making great collections of um, all, all the footballers and all of that. So, yes, uh, uh, um, World it, Cup mania has reached the Reese Moggs. I even watched um, most of the match on uh, Saturday. Fantastic. Um, well, I watched the first half and then listened to the second half on the radio. And will you be watching the semi final that England's progressed? Do you think England can lift the World Cup? Um, Yes, absolutely. And that'll be a great boost for national morale. Good it's preparation. Coming home. It's coming home, yes. <laughs> I'd almost get you to sing. Good I'll singing. Get to sing. No, no, we've done many things. I think that'd be pushing our luck, wouldn't it? Jacob Rees-Mogg, thank you so much for appearing here. I hope we see you with the news.